So, but we have Jeremy Wadrago here with us this morning. He's going to be giving the message. And so Jeremy is a certified financial consultant. He is currently working on his doctoral project in intercultural studies. And speaking of intercultural, all right, when Jeremy speaks, he's, he's from Africa, you guys. They're a little more vocal there than we are, all right? That joy of the Lord, it's going to shine through today, right? We're going to give him his shouts. Yes, we're going to say amen, right, Jeremy? Amen. Amen. <laughs> So we are happy to have Jeremy here. He is our friend, and we're really delighted to hear what he has to share with us, because I just love your perspective on things. Oh, boy. All right. <laughs> Thank you. Up. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> uh, so you can play that video before we, uh, we start. I just want to show you a little short clip from Frank Tarrick that we love so much. It's a claim like, does Christianity oppress people? You may want to ask them, what do you mean by oppress? And by what standard are you saying that that actually is oppression? Because I've noticed that people who say they're not Christians have this moral standard by which they judge Christianity. Where are they getting this standard? And by the way, I also notice that people who claim to be fighting for tolerance and inclusion and diversity are often the least tolerant, the least inclusive, and the least diverse. Try putting something on the internet that agrees with Christianity and disagrees with the current leftist ideology, and you're going to find yourself out of an account, out of a job maybe, and certainly canceled on social media. Because the people who say they're fighting for tolerance, inclusion, and diversity are not tolerant, are not inclusive, and are not diverse. Hallelujah. I knew that somebody was going to say that. <laughs> Uh, I'm excited to be here today, uh, so just sit tight because it's going to be just four hours, so. <laughs> yeah. Amen. So today we're going to talk about salvation, mainly justification and sanctification. And uh, um, I did some research on the SS, uh, Southern uh, Evangelical uh, Seminary website, and I found some interesting statistics that I want to share. Uh, are they there? See? So as you see that portion of the country, 54% of Americans believe that all truth is subjective and there is no moral absolutes. That is very dangerous. Don't you believe so? And uh, I'm going to skip some portion, but look at close to 3%, uh, 3 in every 4 U.S. millionaires agree that whatever is right for your life or works best for you is the only truth you can know. If that's what we believe in, we are in dangerous uh, times. Four, three out of four. That's way too much. And even more shocking is that 63% of believers, churchgoers, these are not like non-believers, uh, they agree that God accepts worship from all religions. 63%, not even 40%, meaning more than half. How do they read the Bible? And 48% uh, agree that the Bible contains helpful accounts of ancient myths, but not literally truth. I know. 54% agree that religious belief is a matter of personal opinion rather than objective truth. And more shocking, on the far right, you see only two in five senior pastors have a biblical worldview. The rest, they just preach the culture. So I just wanted to show you that it is more um, shocking than you can ever imagine. The, the studies, they, they don't die, they don't lie, it's true. So um, we're gonna read Romans chapter six. It is a very long chapter, 22. So I'm not, I don't know how I'm going to finish it. I'm not Pastor Rod that can go through them like Zoom because I wasn't trained for that. So I can preach only two verses, but whatever I, I, I may make it to half an hour, I would stop and then say goodbye. <laughs> yes. Amen. Amen. So I know someone whose name is Jesus Christ Amen. who suffered, he slept, 
Oh, was it right? Was pierced, got his uh, left and right hand pierced on my behalf and your behalf. Because we have someone whose name is Satan, whose sole purpose and end game is to take away God's designed purpose for your life. He infested and affected every aspect of life on earth. There is not a single aspect of life that Satan has, in, has his hands on. And that's why you have these statistics up there. Because his only powerful way of doing things is by deception and lies and trickery. He'll make the truth resemble, uh, the, the lies resemble like the truth and make you buy into it because it sounds so, so good, appealing and amazing and easy and just excellent. He's never changed his style. He never changed his way of doing things since the Garden of Eden. So we are undergoing um, a big cultural shock that's affecting the church as well. So in uh, Romans chapter 1, uh, uh, chapter 6, verse 1, let's read it. What shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? I want to give you some definitions first because they do matter to the, uh, the preaching today. The first one is justification, which is a legal act of God declaring the sinner righteous based on faith in Jesus. And this is not through your work, it's not through merit, but it's through Christ's work alone. So, um, I want to emphasize on the legal terminology. Why? Because the Western cultures do understand what is legal, right? In Africa, not so. We don't care too much about legal, legal stuff. But it's, it does matter. Why? Because what happened is that when Jesus died, he legally took us from Satan's camp and put us in God's camp. Because that was legal. And guess what? Satan is using the same tricks legally to steal you from that camp back to his camp. He cannot use anything that's not legal. Are you confused so far? Yeah. Okay. That's good. It means that it's working so far. So, sanctification that I want to talk about today, specifically speaking because that verse talks about sanctification. The whole 22 verses, it's about that. Um, it is the process of becoming holy. So justification is a one-time process. When you, once you give your life to Jesus and you say, I accept you as my Lord and Savior, automatically you become son and daughter of the king. So there is no, you only need faith and your verbal um, acceptance, right? So that's a one-time thing. However, Sanctification is a process that goes on until you are promoted back to heaven. So it's the process of becoming holy every single day. It's an intentional decision you make to live a holy life, a sanctified life every single day. It's not an event. The first one is an event. The second one is a process. And that's what I want to talk about today, sanctification. Why? Because the culture doesn't care about sanctification. You saw that. Following so far? Yeah. And there's a third word, grace. Grace is a free and unmerited favor from God. And it's manifested in salvation of the sinner through God. So um, it's unmerited. You don't merit it. And it's still another legal term, pardon. You must have heard that in the past, that the present pardon X person. So it's a legal terminology as well. So all those things are legal stuff. So you may be amazed, like, how did we even copy God? Well, because of the Bible. 
That's how America copied everything. Even though we are drifting away from God, we literally copied everything from the Bible. When you talk about morality, how can you talk about God, um, anything outside of the Bible to refer to morality? Make sense so far? So, um, that verse is speaking about a daily progressive lifestyle that believers should adopt. We have a big influence from our culture, and it's so pressing that you want to just hide and not even display your Christian belief. But Christ did not die and say, I didn't know you. He said, I know you by name, and I died for you. So if you're ashamed to display yourself as a believer, then that's, that's, that's too bad. Amen? Amen? So we make that decision to please God, to walk with God, to honor God, to praise him every single day, wherever we are, even where you are not seen, especially when you're not seen. Because you can display the facade in front of people uh, and be like, yes, I am amazing. But once you are somewhere else, you become a different person, right? So that's not what God wants us to do. Um, I want to talk about the heroes of religions uh, just shortly, out of an example. Christ, it is through his blood that we are legally sanctified. So when you take the blood out, there's nothing left. And Christ is the only uh, spiritual or religious hero who died for his people. There's no other religion on earth you will see anyone who died for his people. It's only in Christianity. I'm not speaking about, about the other religions. I'm just saying, comparing to the heroes, he's the only one. Right? He's the only one whose blood can legally cleanse your sins away. No one else. If you want to be made right with God, it has to be only through Christ and Christ alone. Because it says, no other name has been given on earth or in heaven but my name. Amen? Amen. I just want you to see the power of the blood of Jesus because um, I like our ancestors back in Africa. Why? Because they used to do sacrifices of animals and spread the blood on some altars, right? What was the purpose of that? How did they even learn about that? Because of the blood. So the blood has some power that can temporarily cover people's sins so that the gods will be appeased temporarily. Following so far? What kind of blood does it take to cleanse everybody's sins once and for all? It has to be somebody who is saint and holy. And that's Jesus. So there is no need of shedding blood of animals anymore because he died once and for all for us. Amen? Amen. So I want you guys to be very proud of being a believer and displaying it publicly and not being ashamed because, um, especially at work, where when you display it, it's perceived as you are a bad person, you are a hater. Right? That's how we're labeled. But like you saw the video of Frank Tarek, it's the opposite. Because once you try to display the opposite, they come against you like really harsh. So let's go to verse 2. By no means, we are those who have died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? So as a believer, we are not to remain in sin, in attitude, in lifestyle, in behavior, in belief, in our thought process. And the first thing should start with our thought process. That's where Satan attacks first, how you think, how you perceive things, how you understand things. 
Because once he gets your thought process to be aligned with how he wants, then he gets you legally. Why? Because he's been called the accuser of the believers. You know what he does? He will trick you into changing your thought process first. He's the one who tricked you, right? And then he will go to God and say, look at what he did. Because God is just a saint, and he doesn't like sin, right? He will, he will trick you into sinning and then use that to accuse you. Following so far? So by choosing to follow Christ in repentance, we have decided to renounce to evil deeds. Christ is holy, and he wants us to be holy because he purchased us with a special price. Amen? Amen. So if we die to sin, how can we keep on sinning? Question mark. Um, you cannot prevent the flesh from being fleshy. Right? right? But don't let the flesh overtake you into actually accomplishing the action. The action is what matters. You cannot prevent the thought from coming across your head. Sometimes somebody may hurt me and I get like so angry and so mad. I just want to smack them right now. <laughs> that is okay. That's normal. That is our flesh speaking. But me going into action and smacking you, then that's a, that's a problem. Following so far? Yes. So the flesh is flesh. That's normal. We are human beings. You will have those emotions and feelings, but don't let those emotions and feelings lead you to sin. Right. Amen. Amen. Amen? So if you are a believer and you're not growing spiritually, then you're dying spiritually. Meaning you're remaining like a baby Christian. And Christ wants us to grow up to the adulthood status. Because all of, most of us have seen how kids grow. Most of you have had kids and even grandkids, so you know how they grow. Kids, they need milk. Can you live on milk as an adult? Well, you need to go steak like me. So, <laughs> amen. amen. Verse 3. Or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may have a new life. Because of Jesus, we have what? A new life. A real life. So I want to focus on the new life because a lot of Christians don't understand what a new life means. Before we got saved, our lifestyle and our thought process, our beliefs, were retorted by the enemy, completely upside down. Once you come to Christ, you have real life. When I say real life, it's actually life that has substance. Because the life from the world has no substance. It's empty. It is the facade. Make sense? Because the world would trick you to, into thinking, well, well, you know, the world wealth, stardom, uh, just, just being quiet when the, the, the culture is raging. This is how you still live your lifestyle. It has no meaning. It has no substance. But life in Christ on the opposite has meaning. I want to challenge you for something. Just try for one week to live a holy life and come back next week and tell me what was your experience for that week. Just try intentionally to live your life for Christ 100%. Don't even let anything influence you. Just for one week and come back and tell me what you experienced for that week. You will notice there is a big difference between a facade life and a real life because real life is only in Christ. As of Christ, life is tasteless, meaningless, purposeless, and insipid. You will experience that inner peace that you will never had, you have never had in your entire life before. When you purposefully try to live a sanctified life daily, I challenge you to do that. 
You're going to come back and tell me, wow, there's a difference. Because why? It's real life. And guess what? That life is not just on her because God wants us to have that full life. It says, I have come to give you life in fullness. It's fullness, not just insipid life. Why? Because he wants us to live to be healthy physically, emotionally, mentally, financially, at every single level. It's not just spiritually. That is how the enemy lies to believers. Say, well, if you're saved, you should be content. No, God has given us life in its fullness. So if you're not healthy, you have financial problems, you got to go to God and challenge Satan at the court of God because he has stolen something from you. I'm not saying that if you're poor or you are sick, it is always from Satan because God sometimes triggers those things to make us grow. But Satan can legally use sin to steal those things from us because when he shows God, well, look at what he did. God will be like, okay, that's legal. That's how it works. He cannot take anything from you unless you let him do it. Right. Never. There's nothing Satan can do to a believer unless you open the door for him to do that because legally he has no right. I'm going to take an example to show you. If in Mexico, for example, oh, that would be political. But anyways, any other country, you are chasing a criminal to another country, right? Once they enter a new country, you cannot enter there and capture them. Why? Because it's a different country with different laws. Why? Because there's a legal problem right there. That's the same thing. Satan cannot legally come into God's kingdom and take anything from you because it doesn't belong to him. Make sense so far? So the blood of Jesus is that powerful weapon that destroys all strongholds that the enemy can try to trick you into doing. So um, the world can promise you all kinds of goodies, all kinds of amazing stuff. But like I said, remember, it's a trick. There's no life outside God. Chapter, uh, verse 5. For if we have been united with him in death like he is, we will certainly also be united with him in a resurrection like his. So our old life has been crucified and buried. So that is gone. Now we are raised with Christ for a new life. And I didn't finish what I was, my thought process. That life is not just on earth. It carries on through eternity. God doesn't lie. The, the meaning of life in its fullness is like what it is. There's nothing to dig to understand about it. It's clear. It's life on earth throughout eternity that God gives you. If you don't believe me, go and talk to a star. If you, if you happen to know somebody who is like a superstar, I don't know. Just tell them how happy are you outside of God. And they will tell you if they're honest, they will say they're depressed, they're miserable, and life doesn't make sense. Because life doesn't make sense outside of God. That's if they're honest. Because they always display, you know, amazingness. And you'll be like, I just want to be like them. Oh, by the way, I just want to tell you something important. Uh, I was in New York uh, this week because we got a chance to, to go to uh, the New York Stock Exchange to close the, ringing, uh, the closing bell. That was amazing. Uh, it's a once-in-a-lifetime experience. So that, it felt so good. Oh, my goodness. Treat as a VIP even though you know me. <laughs> so it felt good for a short time. But after that, it's like, oh, I'm going back to normal life again. Oh, my goodness. Oh, that sucks. <laughs> Spin a star on CNBC, uh, a national channel for, uh, was it like uh, 30 seconds? I was like, yay. You know, you can Google it on YouTube. You'll see it. But that was it. Here I am. 
again. So just telling you, life outside of God is meaningless. Amen? Amen. Verse uh, 6 through 11. I don't even want to read it. I will just let you read it. Uh, 6 through 11. So the meaning is that when Jesus sets us free, we are no longer slaves of sin. And like I said, all believers, because I have to make that clear, you may think that once you become a believer, you are no longer subject to temptation. That's a lie. Even Billy Graham, uh, Frank Tarek, I'm talking about the big guys that you see on TV and they're like, yeah, this guy is spiritually strong. Yes, every single believer is always tempted by Satan. And, I, and I, when I say uh, by Satan, it is daily, it is day and night. We are fleshy, so we get tired and go to bed. He never gets tired. <laughs> Even comes to you when you are sleeping, believe it or not. So you take a break, but he doesn't. So day and night, he will trick you. So when you think that, well, once I become a believer and I'm covered with the blood of Jesus, I am no longer subject to this end. No, it's not true. Like I said, you cannot prevent the flesh from being fleshy. Right. But don't give in. Following so far? Yes. So the evil force is going to crowd across your mind. Just say no to those you know, you can look once, don't look at twice. Make sense? Yeah. What I mean is that when the thought comes once, just push it away. And that's the tricky, tricky part because you have to pray about it because it's hard to not let the flesh take over, especially when the emotions are so high. So don't give up your freedom to go back to the slavery of sin for Satan. Because there's actually freedom in Christ. What the world says, especially uh, the culture, the, 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 especially the American culture, the freedom that the culture says, because they say Christianity takes away your freedom, right? Yeah. That's a lie. Why? Because, like I said, just try what I said for one week. You're going to be completely free. But the, the, the culture says, well, why would they let you tell you to not do these things or do these things? That's ridiculous. You, you can do whatever you want. So, that's a big conflict right there. But don't let the culture take you down. Amen? Amen. So, like I said, there's a lot to say. So, I'm going to just skip a lot of verses so we can go to... Uh, the end. Uh, verse 23. For the ways of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ our Lord. The Bible talked about a prodigal son that took his birthright and walked away, right? right? That's the same thing because believers can legally sell their birthright with Satan for short live a life on her, for pleasure, for whatever you call it. Just like the prodigal son, when you come back to God, God takes you back open armed. That was human, a human son that came back to his dad and he said welcome and even celebrated his comeback. So no matter how you feel like you have driven away from Christ, God is always waiting for you whenever you're ready to come back to him. Amen? Amen. So sin always leads us to spiritual death and spiritual separation from God. But like you see, the blood of Jesus gives us freedom and salvation through Christ. The only way to God is through Christ. No, nothing else. What they believe is not true because that's not what the Bible says. So we're citizens of the kingdom of God. I want us to behave, think, act, walk, speak, 
like kingdom daughters and sons to God. Amen? Amen. And this should be displayed in our daily lives. Not just coming to church. That is good. Coming to church doesn't make you sanctified. Saying you are a believer verbally doesn't make you sanctified. It is the action. Remember that. The action. Amen? Amen. And I want you to understand that the person we are following is not just anybody. He is everything. And you are not just anyone. You are someone. Why? Because you have been legally transferred from the kingdom of Satan to the kingdom of God. And as long as you remain with that kingdom, borders, nothing can happen to you. And if you feel like you're being wronged by Satan, he's stolen some things from you, I want you to go back with the legal terminology, use the blood of Jesus, and take it back from him. Because that's rightfully given to you by God. And you can rightfully take it back from him again. Amen? Amen. Because God has designed you to thrive physically and spiritually at every single level. I'm not a prosperity preacher, but I know that life in its fullness means everything that life means. Meaning health, finance, jobs, uh, kids, grandkids, whatever you call it, it's everything. Life in its fullness in Christ. Amen. Amen. 